Professor Paulette Kilmer, members of the Banned Books Committee. I'm grateful for the opportunity to add my voice against censorship and banning of the books. I have borrowed the title of my talk from George Orwell's novel with the unusual title of 1984. And the title of my talk is The Long Shadow of the Orwellian Ministry of Truth. The book 1984 centers around the consequences of totalitarianism, mass surveillance, and the repressive regimentation of societies. While the novel points in an allegorical way to Stalin's Russia, it also examines the role of truth or lack thereof in a society. The Ministry of Truth makes sure the past is manipulated to the degree with the present. Basic elements of thought control, as in the book, have been constant throughout history. It may vary in tactics, but intolerance of spoken or printed word remains constant. The common denominator is that some people just don't tolerate what other people have to say, and vice versa. To some it may come as a surprise that many of the classics of English literature were one time or the other were banned and banished from the public arena. And these included Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird, George Orwell's 18, 1984 and also Animal House, J.D. Salinger's The Catcher in the Rye, William Golding's Lord of the Flies, Mark Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath, and many, many more, perhaps in the thousands of books which were at one time banished. I hasten to add that history of opposition to spoken and written word can be put in context with the current political climate in the United States. The reputable and venerable news organizations and newspapers are being accused of disseminating false and fake news. So much so that even recorded words of the president are being discredited by none other than the president himself as fake news. Bob Woodward, the veteran Washington Post reporter, interviewed President Trump about 20 times and recorded the interviews with the president's permission and consent. His book, Rage, should induce rage in those who believe in the sanctity of words and truth. Recorded conversations do not seem to matter because the present day Ministry of Truth, otherwise known as Fox News, OAN or One America Network and Infowars are quite capable of producing rabbits from an otherwise fictitious and non-existing hat. In a macabre twist, we are reliving our villains uh, 1984 in 2020. Mark Twain had famously said that censorship is telling a man he cannot have a steak because a baby cannot chew it. If we apply that reasoning, then we would be applying a cookie cutter approach to human behavior and in the process we will forget that standards and mores change with time. In 1933, a bizarre legal case, the United States versus one book called Ulysses. Now that is the title of the case. The US Supreme Court found that book was utterly without redeeming social importance. This was because the book dealt with nudity. Looking from the present vantage point, it is a sad reminder that how men 
of high intellect and high places can err so easily. But we must take into account changing attitudes with the passage of time. The gradual process of change makes palatable what once was considered unpalatable. In 1928, D. H. Lawrence published his seminal and incendiary novel, Lady Chatterley's Lover, not in his native England, but first in Italy and then in France. The book was promptly banned when published in England in 1960, and the ban was lifted many, many years ago, many, many years later. The novel tells in graphic details sexual encounters between Lady Chatterley, an English woman of high status, and the gamekeeper on her husband's estate. Her husband, a wealthy landowner, is paralyzed from the waist down, is self-absorbed in his books and in his estate. Explicit sex scenes aside, the novel undermines, uh, underlines a young woman's unfulfilled desires and frustrations. That book brought forth the hitherto taboo topic of female sexuality. On a visit to Afghanistan in 2000, during the Taliban rule, I saw a copy of Lady Chatterley's Lover on a sidewalk stall in Kabul where they sell old books and other second-hand items. The shopkeeper did not have any idea of the nature of the book. Had the Taliban been a literate group, they would have thrown the poor bookseller into the dungeon and would have burned the book. The Taliban practiced censorship where only the leaders and the clergy determined what was good for their people. Every human activity was viewed through the narrow prism of religion and tribalism. In Afghanistan, under the Taliban rule, the Orwellian Ministry of Truth was called the Ministry of Enjoining Good and Abandoning Evil. It was a line lifted from the Quran, Ya Maruna Bil Maruf Wa Yanha Anil Munkir. The trouble was, the Taliban, a marginally educated bunch, had a limited worldview and they interpreted the scripture in such a way that reinforced their own prejudices. Thus, they became the final arbitrators of good and evil in the country during their rule. Incidentally, I leafed through Lady Chatterley's lover on the sidewalk in Kabul and did not find it too hard to touch. Since its publication in 1928, it had considerably cooled down. In 1258, the Mongol ruler, Halagu Khan, who was the grandson of Genghis Khan, attacked Baghdad, the capital of the Abbasid dynasty. History has not forgiven Halagu, not because he put to sword the Caliph Mustasim and 90,000 residents of the city, but because he destroyed the magnificent library of Baghdad called the House of Wisdom and dumped all its contents in the river Tigris. According to contemporary accounts, the waters of the river Tigris ran black from the dissolving ink. So the struggle between what people should read and not read in America started in the Western, in, in, started in America, and for that matter in the Western world, with the banning of Thomas Morton's New England Canaan. It was a three volume critique of the Puritans in New England, their atrocities against the Native Americans, and their eagerness to grab their land and resources. Morton refers to New England as the land of Canaan, or in Arabic, Canaan, the promised land of the Bible. The book was promptly banned by the Puritans in 1637 and the author banished 
to a deserted island. Morton's memorable quote about the banning of his book was that the Puritans make great show of religion but no humanity. I have already mentioned that the boundaries between what is acceptable and what is not keep changing with time. What was once incendiary or indecent may not be so now. This leads us to the logical conclusion that we are marching towards a goal of tolerance for the spoken and written word. The reasoning goes that man has become more enlightened and the darkness has been slowly dissipating. That would be, in my mind, an illogical conclusion. For the ground realities contradict that sweeping conclusion. Charles Darwin's theory of evolution has been constantly attacked by the fundamentalist Christians. Their worldview is at variance with the scientific evidence. They believe the Bible to be the true word of God and anything that does not agree with it has to be rejected as false. In 2005, the school board in Dover, Pennsylvania approved teaching intelligent design as an alternate theory to evolution. It was challenged in the federal court in Johnson City. The judge, John Jones, ruled against teaching of intelligent design as a scientific theory. So one would think that after 1925 Scopes trial, popularly called the monkey trial, the matter was settled once and for all, but it was not. Poor Darwin is still being challenged by the self-righteous crowd 171 years after the publication in 1859 of his seminal Origin of Species. So there is a question that begs for an answer. Do people who support banning of the books have any credibility? The answer is a short but an emphatic yes, they do have credibility. We are all driven by certain beliefs, convictions and philosophies that directly contradict what others believe in. And we are oblivious to our own prejudices. In 1988, Salman Rushdie published Satanic Verses. In the book, Rushdie caricatured Prophet Muhammad and his wives. There were violent demonstrations against the author and his book across the Muslim world. Iran issued an edict or fatwa condemning the author to death. Not many people know that Prophet Muhammad is deeply revered by Muslims. So any attempt to insult him are deeply offensive to them. I read the book and while I was impressed by Rashdi's writing, I was deeply offended by his clumsy attempts to, ma to malign the Prophet. But still, I would not stand for banning that book. In the public arena, everyone has the right and a duty to pick up his or her bullhorn and say whatever they want to say. At times, there is no clear-cut demarcation to separate facts from fiction, truth from falsehood, or logic from illogic. Permit me to quote Sir Arthur Conan Doyle to make this point. In the short story, The Empty House, Sherlock Holmes says to Watson, Oh, my dear Watson, there we come into those realms of conjecture where the most logical mind may be at fault. Each may form his own hypothesis upon the present, upon the present evidence, and yours is likely to be correct as mine. In a civil and civilized society, we are not expected to use violence to force our opinions on others. We try to persuade, and if that does not work, we pick up the proverbial bullhorn and protest. 
In a marketplace of ideas, everyone has the right to participate and disagree. We will never reach the utopian state where everyone agrees with each other. My wish is that we never do. That would be a dystopian society as depicted in the book 1984. It happened in the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc Eastern European countries. It happened in the Taliban run Afghanistan. It is true of China today and most of the Arab monarchies. In a democratic society, differences of, of opinion are healthy and should be encouraged. So, in a way, I am encouraged that there are people in our country and across the world who want to force their views on others. And there are people who are resisting that with all their intellectual might. A noisy, boisterous public square is much better and healthy than a quiet, placid, and mostly deserted public square. Just look at the Tiananmen Square in Beijing. I thank you. So, I can, and Dr. Hussein is with us this morning. Would anybody like to ask any questions? I really enjoyed that talk very much. Would somebody like to ask a question? There's a question yes, there. Yes, Sharon. Thanks for the interesting talk, Dr. Hussein. Um, I'm going to ask you a question that I've been asking myself and is going to appear in my presentation as well, and I wonder how you'll respond. Um, I'm struggling with that um, support for the idea that you hate um, and how we respect that uh, people's right to say things that we hate. And in particular, at this moment, I'm struggling with um, white supremacy and how I can make space for uh, opinions that I find so not only hateful, but uh, harmful to other people. Is there a space in your analysis where you say that speech is too harmful uh, to others that it, it like you you're you're an anti-violent person so you would you would not promote violence is can can speech be a hate act in your opinion okay so the question is whether the speech can be hateful yes of course but here is a very fine distinction in my mind and that is whether we should uh, take things in our own hand and try to to stop that speech or we should rely on the laws <clears throat> which we have against insightful and hateful speech. That is a protracted and sometimes long process and which nobody likes. However, short of that, I don't think that I have the right to tell somebody to shut up and, 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 and stop talking because then the same thing would be applicable to me. So I know a white supremacist has as much right to protest or to say whatever they want to say, and that is extremely painful to other people. Uh, I think at this, in this connection, the government and the laws that we have have to come into play and to make decisions whether they should allow a free speech to certain groups or not. I am not going to advocate one way or the other. Would someone... Can I follow up a little oh, bit? Sure. Um, I'm blowing my whole presentation conclusion right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm recording it. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this came, this question really came to me um, because I had a conversation with the late Rain Arroyo, who was a faculty member here, and we both identify as members of the LGBT community. And uh, one year during the Banned Books Week, the student union was flying the gay pride flag 
over the student union and posted it up on the on big on the wall and he and i being of a different generation were both remarking about what a what an amazing thrill it was for us to see uh, a public affirmation and celebration of our identity um, by the institution that we both work for serve etc and um the, but we were thinking about it in terms of the context of the banned books. And I said, well, what if it were the, you know, old Dixie uh, flag, you know, it, you know, how would we, would we, would we stand firm in our uh, celebration of the right of uh, freedom of speech? And we were trying hard to find a way to say, no, it, it would not be okay for the institution to support that value. It's okay for them to support our value, even though we know our identities are hated by people. Um, and I, I think I'm trying to find a little room <laughs> uh, to, to say, no, the institution does not have to support all speech. Uh, and as an institution, it does not have to do that. So that's the background. I wonder if that, if you want to comment on that or if you have thoughts about that. Well, I think it's every institution uh, has the right to say no. But beyond the institution, there is another uh, uh, code, uh, and that is the, the laws. I mean, university can tell me that I should not talk as a faculty member. What recourse do I have? Recourse is to go to the court of law and knock their door and ask them Am I being uh, closed? Uh, just stop from expressing my views. This is not a new debate. This has been with us in one form or the other uh, ever since the modern American institutions uh, have been um, in play. So I see, I see a lot of things on the university campus I don't like. But as a former board member and a current faculty member, I don't have the right to tell them. Now, I will engage some people in, in, in intellectual conversation and tell them I do not like what my views are, but that seldom happens. Uh, but, you know, the next step is when you tell somebody to shut up is a uh, escalation of this conversation, which conversation becomes a brawl. And I don't think that we should encourage that. But I will again emphasize that we have laws against hateful speech. Uh, and the law sometimes is blind and sometimes is totally blind. I, may I sh share with you an anecdote? <clears throat> um, this is about seven, eight years ago. Somebody took upon himself to uh, start sending me emails. They were insulting emails, but that is good. Uh, no, not everybody has to agree with my views in my writings in the Blade or other newspapers. But when he started sending me emails saying that you are in my crosshair and there are going to be a turkey shoot. So I reported that to the sheriff and they said, no, this is beyond a freedom of speech. So they... Uh, uh, sued him in, 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 in the court of law in, in uh, Maumee and the judge um, was totally blind, I think. Um, and his verdict was, and I'm paraphrasing, even though he is a no good son of a blah, 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 but he has the right. Does he have the right to threaten me as a Turkey should? No, he doesn't. Does he have right to tell me a bastard or whatever he wants to tell me because of my views? Yes, he has the right. So sometimes the law also misreads what the intention of a certain person is. This is my personal story. It happened with me. Amonti would like to say something. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Hussein, uh, for a very enlightening presentation. Uh, you mentioned so many points uh, for us to ponder. Um, at least for me, there were several, many. Um, but I just want to find out your comments about one of the points. 
um, um, you gave us, um, you, you let us know that, and I do know to that throughout history that people use um, scriptures to more or less, is Dr. Hussein there? Yes, I'm listening to you. Okay. Uh, the yeah. use of scriptures by folks to reinforce uh, our prejudices. And um, it seems as if uh, more recently than even in the past, uh, it's getting worse in terms of um, having family uh, confrontations or disagreements and maybe even with friends. So I wanted to find out from you if you, um, your own way or your advice in terms of how one can have an engaging discussion, uh, trying to demystify or at least um, 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 as it relates to the use of scriptures, because again, if families, there are some families, I was born in Nigeria, and some families, we have both Muslim and Christian individuals. And sometimes at the family table, there could be a problem. Would it be better not to discuss religion and even our attitude uh, towards um, things? Um, or do you think it's still important that we engage in some form of discussion? And how can we do that so that we all agree to disagree or disagree to agree at the end of the day? Well, uh, religion is a very hot topic, you know. Uh, Lady Chatterley's lover has cooled down, but the religious scriptures have not. Mm -hmm. They're still very hot. Uh, and people who believe in them, literally, uh, that is the only point of view they have. And so when I suppose I gave a presentation uh, somewhere and somebody will stop and he says, I don't agree with you because it is not in the Bible mm -hmm. or it is not in the Quran. And I tell them, if you go to a court of law internationally, then all the individual countries, they don't have a law to argue. They have an international law to argue. And if you and I are going to talk about this issue, then I will have to leave my scripture outside and you have to leave your scripture outside because we will never agree because of the contradictions which are inherent between different faiths. We can find common ground, but anyway, um, no, I will engage people, but I will engage them only to learn and inform rather than to prove that I'm right. And I have a, a wonderful recipe for you. And that's why I am intellectually against proselytization. I don't believe in that. Although my religion does, Christianity does, uh, but I don't believe in uh, going people and telling them, uh, you know, I have something fantastic for you. <laughs> I'm still struggling with my own faith and to understand it takes a lifetime. And how can I tell you or anybody else that uh, come to me and I'll show you the path? No. So I don't engage people who are firebrand and uh, have already ideas, but if somebody asks me, a question, I will try to answer it. And similarly, I will learn from other people. Thank you. So is, some, is there any activity with questions from the social media? Well, there is well, nothing yet on YouTube. Yeah. On Facebook, uh, Heidi is saying great words, Amjad. Sorry? Uh, there's this person, it's Heavy M. Apple. Oh, that's yeah. the Dean of Honors. One of, my, one of my most favorite, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the comment is great words, Amjad. Comment is what? Great words, Amjad. He really liked your presentation. Oh, <laughs> yeah. She is the Dean of the Honors College. Well, Isn't that? Friend of this event. I mean, she's the Dean of the Commerce College. She's a wonderful lady. I have spoken to her college a few times. Yeah, and I'm grateful, Heidi, if you're listening, I'm grateful for your comments. Thank you. So, Symmetra, do we have any comments from YouTube or questions? Um, 
Nothing on YouTube yet. Okay. <laughs> Would somebody else like to ask Dr. Hussein a question here? Sure. We have a little bit of lag with the social media. I'm very proud of Arjun and Ali and Symmetra for getting all three of them going. So it's not a criticism, it's just the way the technology works. Okay, so Dr. Yasmin Farah is on Facebook is saying, beautiful advice and words by Dr. Hussain. Always learn from him. So there are comments coming and there is no question, but uh, yeah, people are commenting. Well, this is good, this is good. This question always is there, isn't it? How do we, how do we talk to people we really disagree with? So they, they, uh, Paulette, I think people, a conversation only happens when two people feel equal to each other. If one is standing on a pedestal and the other is down, uh, no, there is no conversation. It is condescending uh, dialogue. And for that reason, I mentioned this earlier is, I don't think anybody has God-given right to feel superior to another person. I mean, really, uh, because you are negating somebody's humanity by saying, I'm better than you are. Yeah. So if we have that common denominator that we are all equal and our ideas may be stupid, of anybody's, but that does not mean that we can belittle somebody. And that is the essence of a civil discourse in any society or any community. When people get very hot under the collar, have you ever seen anything resolved when there are people shouting at each other? Never, it doesn't happen because everybody hears the echoes of their own voices. It's an echo chamber. You have to get out of the echo chamber to talk to each other. So I, I'm all for dialogue, but I'm all for dialogue in a very calm and reasoned uh, fashion. Otherwise, it become a shouting match. And I personally have not engaged in that. Uh, except with my children. Um, I mean, that's different. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like there's a question from Facebook. Uh, just posted in the chat here. Uh, Heidi M. Apple, uh, um, the Dean of Honors, she says, I think humans have always lived in an age of intolerance. Is today any different? I don't think so. However, just because we're having this conversation is positive, right? Um, this has been the hallmark of uh, human beings uh, to disagree, to shout, and then violence. Yeah, those are the three steps. They may not escalate to the same level from point A to point Z, but uh, this happens. And that's where the institutions, that's where you, Heidi, as a teacher, uh, and I as a teacher, uh, we should come into play. I think we should set an example. You have, I'm trying to uh, set an example to the students and to have a dialogue. You can teach anything controversial in the classroom without taking a position or a side because the students have to learn how to talk how to converse with each other. And the whole life is not really, it's, it's uh, easy. It's, uh, it's full of booby traps and full of landmines. And, 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 and our job as teachers is to prepare a generation of students to be tolerant to each other. Uh, here, let me, uh, get me uh, uh, bring one other point, and that is when somebody says you should tolerate other people, uh, and um, it's true mostly in uh, in terms of religion. And I said no. 
To tolerate is a negative word. You don't say that I, I live in a beautiful neighborhood and I tolerate my neighbors. No, you accept your neighbors. So when a Christian, when a, when a Catholic tells me that he accepts me, he is not diminishing his Christianity. And if I tell a Hindu that I accept you, I am not diminishing my faith, Islam, as you understand it. So we should accept each other without losing our own individual religious identity. Now that is the point where I fight on and that is, no, don't tell me that we should tolerate each other. No, this is a negative term in my dictionary. I think I've spoken more than I should. No, you're the speaker. It's your job to speak, in fact. But we do see what a difference it makes when we regard each other with respect and dignity. Sure. And when in a conversation, instead of planning what we are going to say next, we actually listen to the other person. Right. I think this is a very common thing that uh, when somebody's talking, other people are already thinking of what argument they're going to put forward yeah, yeah. without even listening as to what person has to say. I think we, most of us suffer from that weakness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, the, I, I keep coming back to classroom. I think the university and the colleges are the places where we teach that to the students. This is our responsibility. Well, do we have another question or comment? Anything from social media? We have a comment from Sharon Barnes in Zoom. She says, my trouble is with people whose value is intolerance. I have trouble accepting intolerance. I would say that to a loud amen. Allowed. Amen. I have another question, uh, Dr. Hussein. Are we allowed, are we allowed, um, Paulette? How many questions are we allowed each person? Oh, I don't. Oh. This is one, one. Okay, okay, I'm okay. The freedom of one, expression one, event. One, one, one and a half, two, two and a half. <laughs> no, please go ahead. Well, the whole idea was maybe it will spur others to ask questions. Otherwise, I can wait and uh, ask this. Go later. ahead and ask. Okay. You're on right now. No, I please ask. Ask. Yes. <laughs> so, Dr. Hussein, it's back again. I'm thinking of our young children and even grandchildren. Um, what advice would you have for parents, grandparents, um, with all that's going on, particularly lately in terms of politics, assuming you are watching the TV with them, for instance, watching the um, uh, last, the first uh, debate, uh, presidential nominees debate. Um, how, how can we explain what's going on to them uh, when they see adults uh, interact the way they interact? Although uh, I'm a professor of psychology, I would still want to hear your view on that. I, I don't have any views. I have, I have views which are very dear to me and I keep them close to my heart. Uh, but how to tell children, I will tell them that this is not what you want to be when you grow up, really. I mean, uh, uh, I mentioned in the beginning of my keynote uh, that when the facts becomes non-facts and all that thing, uh, this has been going on uh, with us. And I think we have a responsibility uh, to not shield children, but to make them aware and to make them understand. Yeah, I know I don't have any uh, magic formula beyond that. And thank God my children are grown. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are almost to one o'clock. So maybe now I should say one more question. Does anybody have one more question? Does anybody have one more comment? 
Yes, Sadia. So my question is that, um, like you said earlier, that you cannot stop everyone from talking, like as we were talking about uh, white supremacists earlier. So what should we do with the trauma that comes with it? Like, I mean, like, if you're letting some people talk openly and freely because they have a right to talk, Mommy, but it's also giving Mommy, a trauma and it's also like a developing a fear in a small or marginalized group. Mommy, and we have to live with Mommy, those groups. I'm sorry. Mommy. Yes, Mama. Well, pick her up. Pick her up and just put her so in she your... She not want me. She want me to change her cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> she don't need mother. She need iPad. Like mother, like daughter. Go ahead. <laughs> so, I mean, I feel like that... that there is this hidden fear which is seeding so deep into our souls that while teaching our kids that you don't want to be that person when you grow up, but you're not sure or certain about the, about the future of your kids and your future because you kind of have started living in that unknown fear. So I have no idea how to deal with that fear and that that fear that's like rooting in and what if I'll transfer that fear to my kids too while letting them know that everyone has a right to talk freely even if it's like threatening for you. But I mentioned that uh, a few questions back Sadia and I mentioned this thing yes some speech is uh, undesirable unpalatable um, and I think there should be some laws governing that. So the difference between what is permissible and what is absolutely not permissible, uh, maybe uh, the distance may be very big uh, between these two. We just have to live with it because what is the opposite of that? Suppose if you had the power to shut somebody up, it's, I mean, I, I don't want to have that power. Now, I have imagined in my head that if somebody is really abusing me or somebody that I love or whatever, that how could I shut them up? But I have to subordinate those ideas to other facts of life. Yes, I, whenever there was a controversial uh, decision, controversial publication, uh, there was always this thing to shut this up. And, and the history is replete with examples of uh, people taking and, 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 and saying things which other people did not like. But somehow, somehow uh, that in the long run, uh, look at the Pentagon Papers, Pentagon Papers. Uh, uh, didn't the U.S. government put all his might to stop New York Times from publishing it? If they were published. And what happened? We found out a lot more about the war at uh, uh, Vietnam than uh, we were led to believe. It's a double-edged sword. And I think we as citizens have to be cognizant and we have to live with it. And we have to play our own part. Every one of us has the obligation to play some kind of a part. Just because we are having this conversation, I think is healthy and positive. So I gave you a non-answer to a beautiful question. Well, thank you, Dr. Hussein. Thank you, Sadia. Okay, my pleasure. So you are gonna, uh, one o'clock is the beginning of this uh, program. In just a second, I always identify what we're doing. <laughs>